Good evening, everyone. I am Sukhendu Das, uh, speaking on behalf of Center for Research in Post Humanities, Bakura University. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce our guest today, Travis Holloway. Travis is Assistant Professor of Philosophy at SUNY Farmingdale, a translator and a poet and former Goldwater Fellow in Creative Writing at New York University. His primary interests are in contemporary continental philosophy, aesthetics, social and political philosophy, queer theory, and the environmental humanities. His work on these topics has been published in Italy, Turkey, the UK, Colombia, Canada, and the Says Republic, and the US. His most recent publications include Philosophy at the End of the World for a Counter History of Human Beings in the Anthropocene, A Strategy for Democracy, Neoliberalism, and the Future of Democracy, and How to Perform a Democracy. He is co-translator of two books and several articles by Jean-Luc Nossi and co-author of several public-facing articles and the book titled Occupying Wall Street, The Inside Story of an Action That Changed America. He is currently working on two monographs. One is Philosophy at the End of the World. Time, Art and Politics in the Age of the Anthropocene. The second one is How to Perform a Democracy. Holloway has received fellowships from the Fulbright Commission, the DAD, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, and the Max Gate Institute for Research and Advanced Study in Germany, France, and Italy. Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Devnan Bandhubadhyay can't join us today due to some urgent official meeting. Uh, he was supposed to launch this book. However, he has sent his best wishes to the author. Now I'm honored to launch his latest book, How to Live at the End of the World: Theory, Art, and Politics in the Anthropocene. Here is Travis's book. I formally launch this book. Uh, it has been published by Stanford University Press. I won't say much in much about this book because we all are eager to hear Travis's talk on this book. All I can say is that this book is a timely contribution to the Anthropocene debate. I have read this book with much pleasure and will review this book shortly. Travis, the platform is all yours now. A nice introduction. Uh, thank you also for spending a perfectly nice Saturday evening uh, in India <laughs> doing this sort of thing with me. Um, before I begin, I, I don't want to, um, I want to make sure that I thank uh, all of your work. Um, I don't know if all of you know how, the about the indefatigable uh, Sukhendu Das who manages and organizes um, uh, several things along with other colleagues at Bankura. So um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I'm, um, I'm especially excited about uh, what the Center for Research in Post-Humanities is doing for contemporary theory and its interventions. Um, but I won't, I won't go on with that. So if you'll permit me, I'm going to lay out the architecture of my book uh, and I'm going to share my screen now, which you should see. Yes, it is uh, visible. Great. Around 11,500 years ago, the Earth entered into a relatively warm, stable climate period known to geologists as the Holocene. You can see this here. Named after the Greek word for whole or all together, the Holocene describes a brief segment of geological time so the, on a 50,000 year timeline in which human beings were able to flourish in a warm climate alongside other forms of life on earth. 
supposedly all together as a whole or hollows. Our planet has now entered an era of instability for the first time since the last ice age. The epoch into which we have entered has been called an Anthropocene due to our species destabilizing effects on life itself. Earth system science charts like this indicate this transition. So do assessments like the IPCC report, which tell us when and where to expect climate impacts, as well as how to mitigate them and prepare for them. This year, I've also been fortunate to collaborate with a few climate scientists from Columbia University and NYU in New York. Here's what this science tells us to expect. In the next few years, higher temperatures, drought, and the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere will begin to cause food insecurity. It will affect key crops like corn, wheat, and soybeans in different ways. For example, corn will often burn up or roast. Wheat, which grows at higher latitudes, will thrive as a plant, but the nutritional value and protein in the plant will gradually be reduced due to the CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere. As I bear with me as I toggle a few screens here. Uh, to put it another way, the plant will thrive in the CO2, but it will not thrive for us. Extreme droughts will intensify in specific predictable regions like Western North America, Eastern Mediterranean, or Northeast Asia. Other places will continue to experience unprecedented uh, precipitation events, so-called rain bombs where the amount of rainfall a single storm produces far surpasses anything ever recorded. Extreme lasting heat will pop up in unforeseen places. Jet streams could slow or stall as they did over Europe last summer. In all of this, a million plant and animal species are at risk of extinction. Storms will be far more frequent and far more severe there will be coastal flooding and wildfires on a new scale. And while all of this, uh, all of us, all of us really will be affected by climate change, it will not affect all of us in the same way. Lower latitudes, island nations, the global south, the poorest on the planet, other forms of life will experience some of the worst impacts of climate change, even though they have produced far fewer emissions. I think one of the pressing tasks confronting us today in the humanities is to engage seriously with this new era of climate change, a so-called Anthropocene. Just when another world no longer seemed possible, another world has become inevitable. In truth, one way or another, the specter of climate change will motivate political changes in ways that were unimaginable in prior decades. Climate change will intrude on our systems of government in this century, whether we act or don't, whether we want it to or not, and sadly, whether we are more or less responsible for climate change and more or less able to shelter ourselves from it. It is easy to imagine how this new period of history could go. Famine, ethno-nationalisms, borders, walls, wars, allowing the most vulnerable to suffer without aid or mass migration, a new era of colonization even. So I think we have to propose seriously a counter history for human beings in the Anthropocene. We have to consider the conditions of our own historical moment in a way that sharpens our understanding of it, touches us, and introduces the possibility of a different future. Still, it's not sufficient, for a theorist like me at least, to think about this alternative future in terms of abstract norms or principles. That is, in terms of a world that we do not live in and will never live in. It seems to me that the more difficult theoretical work is to consider whether the conditions are present for the mobilization of a different way of life. And this is what interests me about the Anthropocene. When we think about the conditions needed to build a movement, all of the elements are already here for it. A new era of climate change is collectivizing and politicizing our populations with a shared threat and a new sense of history. It is revealing that our market-based economic systems are out of step with the way life flourishes. And it is intruding on our public spheres 
from the outside. Still, this new sense of history begs for a specific form of politics to address it. For this reason, my new book proposes a counter history for human beings in the Anthropocene. In the book, I meditate on the phrase, the end of the world in a polyvalent way with several meanings in view in order to think about several things all at once. To put it another way, I use the phrase, the end of the world throughout the book like a translator who can't decide on one word or meaning to describe something. Sometimes the end of the world means thinking through the end of the Holocene, the sixth extinction, the unimaginable loss of life and biodiversity. At other times, it means reckoning with the human exceptionalism in our stories or our fields of study. Often, it means seeing our way out of capitalism's worldlessness and impossibility. At other times, the end of the world means accounting for a new encounter with nature and the resurgence of epic narrative in contemporary art. The end of the world is the need to begin the end of the white world as a decolonial project, as Aimé Césaire put it. It is a place where other forms of life that were said to be worldless or outside of our human world can appear alongside us in public space. I'd like to meditate on this uh, phrase then, the end of the world, in a polyvalent way with you to rethink three perennial questions in humanities against the specter of catastrophic climate change, questions of time, art, and politics. Here then, if you'll permit me, I'll lay out the architecture of my book, How to Live at the End of the World, Theory, Art, and Politics for the Anthropocene. Part one, time at the end of the world. There is a very different sense of being in time today as a result of planetary climate change. Historians tell us that the customary distinction between human histories and natural histories has to be collapsed. So too the frequent philosophical distinction between the world and the earth, between human life and natural life has to be called into question. Politically, youth are distraught about their future globally and feel that previous generations and their governments have intentionally abandoned them. And how many stories or works of art today imagine us dying together rather than alone? We live in a planetary age that is defined supposedly by what it means to be human. The most predominant and accessible narrative for this new period of history was introduced initially by geologists and atmospheric chemists. In an article published in 2000 titled The Anthropocene, Paul Crutzen and Eugene Stormer used the term Anthropocene to argue that we had entered into a new human-dominated geological epoch in the Earth's history. They posited that this geological period began with the invention of the steam engine and its use of fossil energy. By 2016, a group of prominent geologists formally concluded that the Earth had entered into a new era, an Anthropocene, so named because it is defined by humans' impact on the planet. The consequences of these geologists' decision to name a new geological epoch as an Anthropocene went well beyond the scope of geology itself. They had introduced a new grand historical narrative for our time. Surprisingly, in the humanities and the social sciences, this grand historical narrative was inherited by the very scholars who had most resisted grand narratives in the last half century. This part interests me very much. The first scholar to inherit the term Anthropocene in a major publication in the humanities and social sciences was actually Subaltern Studies co-founder and Marxist historian Dipesh Chakrabarti. As it will be known to many of you, in previous years, Chakrabarti taught philosophers and historians the need to provincialize or localize their totalizing and imperialistic historical claims. Claims like world history or universal history, always written from the point of view uh, of Europe, um, or often written by, uh, from the point of view, I should say. Um, but then after an experience with wildfires in 2003, Chakrabarti described a sense of falling into deep history, as he put it. He turned his attention immediately to scientific journals and debates about geological periodization. In his landmark 2009 essay, The Climate of History, which you see here on your screen, Chakrabarti's key insight was that historians had made the mistake of viewing human history as separate from the history of the planet. Instead, Chakrabarti argued, we had to learn to think about human beings as having a geological force. And to do this, we had to think about human beings as a species. Chakrabarti famously concluded his 2009 essay with these controversial words, 
there is an emergent new universal history of humans that flashes up in the moment of danger that is climate change. To experience this shared sense of catastrophe necessitates the question of a human collectivity and us in a new era of the Anthropocene. But Chakrabarti was careful to underscore that in contrast to universal theories of the enlightenment, for instance, whatever this human collectivity it was, it was not, uh, unlike a Hegelian universal, it could not subsume particularities. Still, Chakrabarti received enormous backlash for introducing the idea of human beings as a collective geological force or what's known as species thinking. Instead of differentiating human histories more clearly in terms of carbon emissions, colonialism, power, race, class, and so on. Despite the debate over Chakrabarti's work, the question that Chakrabarti raised would alter the humanities and the social sciences for years to come. This question would be, how might our areas of study, of politics, history, philosophy, art history, better periodize or make sense out of the emergence of an Anthropocene? My small contribution to this debate over Chakrabarti's work and how to live at the end of the world is to propose using philosophy's counterpart to geological dating, the genealogical method, to better periodize the Anthropocene. Like the geologists attempting to date and describe the Anthropocene as a distinct geological epoch, the philosophical method of genealogy attempts to distinguish between periods as Nietzsche described it. Still, the method of genealogy allows us to periodize anthropogenic events in a more differentiated way in terms of power and resistance. For example, as Nietzsche had done in terms of an upper class morality and a lower class morality, or as Foucault had done in terms of Victorians and other Victorians, or the mad and the rational. Or finally, I think more interesting in this context as Sylvia Winter had done in terms of the human and Anthropos and the human other. Unlike the totalizing universal narrative of the Anthropocene, genealogies are local and provincial. Nietzsche insists on this point in the genealogy of morals. And very importantly, the genealogical method allows us to periodize anthropogenic events or golden spikes in terms of the cultural values and ideas surrounding those events. As Nietzsche put it, one must not only distinguish between periods, but account for the values that spring up or sprang up within these periods. Finally, whereas master narratives about history often leave us with a false sense that no future exists outside of them, genealogies direct us towards ways of life that are outside of these narratives to, to what could be called counter histories. Using the philosophical uh, historical method of genealogy in this way then, I began by trying to connect the geological periodization of the Anthropocene with the history of ideas, marrying the spikes of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere with influential words and concepts that came to be around the same time. I was also attempting to rewrite the history of the Anthropocene, which has been criticized for being a universal narrative told from the perspective of the global North. Um, I was trying to rewrite it in terms of power and resistance, um, and thus to include subaltern counter histories and alternative anthropogenic events. What I discovered about doing this work is that it was possible to excavate a shadow archive to find hidden records of colonization, slavery, plantations, fossil capitalism, heteropatriarchy, war, and other scenes of power and subjection in the geological strata of the earth, for example, from the 15th to the 17th century, the genocide of the indigenous peoples of the Americas and the reforestation of their land is actually registered by an unlikely decrease in carbon dioxide in the ice cores from the same period. The genocide is documented in the CO2 itself. What else are we able to know or document in this way? In my book, I chart a specific philosophical text alongside this decrease in CO2 from the 15th to the 17th century. A philosophical treatise I focus on was an early and highly influential text in Italian Renaissance humanism that was used in the 16th century to justify the colonization of the Americas. Written in four, uh, 1486, six years before Columbus's initial voyage, Pico della Mirandola's oration on the dig dignity of man describes man at the center of the world. I use man in quotes here. It says that this man has no fixed limits or boundaries. It explains that he, it is always a he, gender is really an interesting and important here, must give laws to those outside the center and below him, 
namely to animals, plants, nature, brutes, and even the stars. So the opposite of what we might call a flat ontology. It places this man in what it calls a natural heterosexual couple and tells this man to breed or propagate the race. Based in part on Sylvia Winter's work, what I show is that this philosophical text, Pico's 1486 treatise on the dignity of man, was used in the next century to justify for the first time the political or secular raison d'etat for the colonization of the Americas. Until the mid 16th century, the justification for the colonization of the Americas had been limited to a religious one, to spread the good news of Christ and to save the souls of the indigenous peoples of the Americas. But then the Royal Humanist of Spain, Gines de Sepulveda, used Pico's 1486 philosophical treatise to argue for the first time that law, politics, and order had to be brought to the Americas because the indigenous population there was not fully human. As Achille Mbembe has put it, historically the expansion of colonialism had to do with the broader question, who is it that the earth belong to, belongs to? That was the key question, he says, underlying colonial conquest and imperial expansion since the 15th century. Powers decided that the earth in its entirety belonged to them. My question, a philosophical question is, who introduced the corresponding idea of man for this and when? I also try to show that Pico's 1486 philosophical text was used, uh, it was uh, introduced a very different relationship with the land in the Caribbean and in the Americas. Malcolm Ferdinand has documented this new relationship to the land in the Caribbean context better than anyone in his book, Decolonial Ecology, Thinking from the Caribbean. Ferdinand documents what he calls a matricide in which colonists uprooted indigenous myths referring to the land as a mother and replaced those myths with myths referring to the land as a father, a matricide. Gender again is significant throughout all of these texts. The other thing that documents what actually happened is the earth itself. From the years of 1500 to 1700, we see a surprising decrease in CO2 in the earth's atmosphere, which can be dated through ice cores from this period. Geologists working with social sciences believe that this decrease in CO2 narrates a genocide that caused the indigenous population in the Americas to go from 60 million to 6 million in 150 years or so. Along with this genocide, the decrease in CO2 emissions during this period tells another uncomfortable truth, that the decrease in CO2 is not only the result of genocide, but a result of a carbon sink, namely the reforestation of indigenous land that had been burned or cleared on a massive scale. It thus reveals that indigenous communities in the Americas were separately practicing mass deforestation, land clearing, mass burnings. And while this clearing of the land was not at all as destructive as the colonization, new crops, the slave labor of the plantation scene uh, was, um, it was also not insignificant as we can see in the CO2. And thus, while many have emphasized a European starting point to the Anthropocene, Britain's use of coal or enlightenment philosophy, Others, like Chakrabarti, have argued that it is false and imperialistic to reduce the Anthropocene to a Eurocene and universalize it. In his 2021 book, The Climate of History in a Planetary Age, Chakrabarti cites alternative starting points for the Anthropocene that don't begin in Europe, agricultural practices, deforestations, uh, large-scale burnings. He records how many of the anti-colonial state projects of the last century were just as fossil fuel driven, if not more so, as imperialist state projects had been. Finally, Chakrabarti argues that the Anthropocene is not simply somehow the result of European philosophy or a European way of life taking root in the psyche of colonized subjects. He shows that we find a similar narrative to Renaissance humanism in works such as Rabindranath Tagore's Religion, uh, The Religion of Man from 1931. Like Pico's treatise, Oration on the Dignity of Man, Chakrabarti argues that Tagore's The Religion of Man describes separately, in a co-original way, human beings as the center of things, as exceptional, as the viewer of all or the whole, as lawgivers. Since Tagore's philosophical work does not replicate or derive from European ideas, Chakrabarti argues, here we see how the value or idea of human exceptionalism over other species in nature is found in multiple places separately. 
As we seek to better understand anthropogenic events then, we must tell multiple stories of anthropogenesis or multiple beginnings for the Anthropocene. We need these stories to locate systems of ideas and ways of being that account for the actual birth or births of the Anthropocene. The question that this poses for us then, I think is this, how do we connect our areas of study in the humanities or the social sciences to climate history, to geological history, to the history of greenhouse gases or CO2? I propose a method for doing this using philosoph uh, philosophy's counterpart to geological dating, genealogy, and its um, counter-historical method of periodization. Part two, art at the end of the world. This new sense of history that we are discussing here is already around us in our stories and in our art. Chunks of glacial ice melting outside a museum. An art installation where participants live forecast the weather. Figures of old white men arguing about politics in a public square, oblivious to the water rising up around them. In short, there has been a sea change in our stories and imaginaries as a result of climate change. And whether we know it or not, the sea change is already destroying the narratives that are most responsible for climate change. These stories are collectivizing, historicizing us before a shared sense of catastrophe, challenging us to confront climate change collectively. But far more broadly, they show us that the way that we are forced to live biopolitically is in conflict with life itself, with the way life flourishes. In the second chapter of my book called The Transition from Postmodern Art to the Anthropocene, I discuss contemporary works of art and narrative about strange weather. And I conclude with a genealogy of different ways of looking at clouds. I do this because odd weather is one of the growing ways human beings are experiencing climate change beyond abstract scientific data. Even those who do not believe in climate change experience these weather events. The weather is also one of the first things human beings talk about with one another or share today, and at least since the great flood in the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of our earliest known recorded stories. This story about increasingly strange or more violent weather, another hottest year on record, the storm of the century again, is perhaps the most common story about climate change that we are telling one another, whether one realizes it or not when the story is told. And each time we tell it, we seem to be producing a new collective narrative that directly contradicts narratives responsible for climate change, like individualism, self-entrepreneurship, competition, hierarchy, anthropocentrism. Instead of talking today about the works of art, uh, about weather that I discuss in the book, I'd like instead to consider a few different contemporary works of art and a few recurring features in them. Maybe what might be described as um, uh, works of art that are uh, key to thinking about art in the Anthropocene. I want to be clear, though, from the outset, my effort is certainly never to suggest that any type of art is or should be universal. That would be a terrible prescription for artists. Um, it's really to begin to translate some contemporary artworks into discursive modes of thought in an attempt to think about what it is that we're doing, what rituals or practices we're performing, and what narratives we are telling one another in this new era of climate change. So one, the art at the end of the world. Contemporary art is often rehearsing the end of the world today. Allow me to localize or provincialize this claim by considering the work of several New York based artists over the last few years. To see the earth before the end of the world, which you see on your screen, was a 2022 installation by the Nigerian American and New York City artist and poet, Precious Okoyama. It was one of the most celebrated pieces at last year's Venice Biennale. It was also one of the largest installations at the Biennale, taking up an entire room in the central exhibition space. To see the earth before the end of the world is inspired by Edouard Glissant's 1961 play, Monsieur Toussaint which tells the life of the leader of the Haitian revolution, Toussaint Louverture, and of colonization's effect on black and indigenous bodies and on the natural effects uh, uh, resources of the Caribbean. 
The installation uses sugarcane to tell the story of the extraction of natural resources that have enslaved labor via the plantation. Perhaps the most interesting aspect is that the artist adds the invasive Japanese vine kutsu, an extremely fast growing weed. Throughout the span of the Venice Biennale from late April to the end of November, the vine quickly overtook the rest of the installation, even covering the figures themselves. To see the earth before the end of the world, the artist says, questions what will survive. It speculates that what will survive is not the world, but the earth, not colonization, capitalist extraction, whiteness, nor human beings, but a plant that invades, overtakes, even restores. We find similar depictions in pop culture here in the US in films like Annihilation or the popular TV series, uh, The Last of Us. Precious Okayaman is not the only New York-based artist, though, to think the end of the world in recent years. Novels like Ben Lerner's 1004 or Andrew Durbin's MacArthur Park, both of which were written in New York City after Hurricane Sandy, take place in the time of unlikely and devastating urban storms. On a personal note, there seemed to be a new collective consciousness about climate change among uh, artists in New York after Hurricane Katrina, but far more so after a hurricane hit New York City in uh, 2012 and left half the city without power. Author and current chief editor of Freeze Art Magazine, Andrew Durbin, says that his novel about a hurricane hitting a major city is an attempt to consider an emancipatory politics that might avert, uh, emerge from the ecological wreckage of our moment in opposition to the current economic configuration of the world. Harlan, Mitchell, uh, Harlan Miller's etching uh, here exhibited at the 2017 Armory Show in New York City summed up the sentiment comedically. Armageddon, is it too much to ask? And here I think it's very interesting whether this is a fear or, or something like a wish. Two, the reinvention of epic. In 1979, in The Postmodern Condition, Jean-Francois Lyotard famously described postmodernism as the rejection of grand narratives and a return to little narratives or le petit récit. What was at stake in this project was immense and very important, I suspect, for many of us. It meant that grand enlightenment narratives of a universal or world history or totalitarian narratives had to actively be provincialized and deconstructed. It also meant that a supposedly universal humanism which was always the humanism of straight, affluent, able-bodied white European men had to be splintered or fractured by decolonial cultural theory, queer theory, gender theory, black studies, class struggle, and so on. The postmodern duty or answer, as the Ota put it, was to wage a war on totality, on grand historical narratives. Given this allergy to grand narrative or epic, in a supposedly postmodern society, for Leotar at least, what should we make of the significant amount of art today that returns to meta narrative or epic? Consider, for example, Octavio Abendez's A Select History of Humanity here. The Mexican artist Octavio uh, Abendez's A Select History of Humanity proposes an epic narrative that folds human history into geological time. A series of note card like placards. Uh, based on Gerhard Richter's color charts, by the way. Um, so he's, there's a, a, a bit of a of an appropriation here. Um, records events throughout geological and human history, such as the sun forms 4,567,000,000 BC, or circa 25,000 BCE, age of the oldest found permanent human settlement, or 589 AD, first reference to the use of toilet paper in China. This select history of humanity, as the title goes, does not claim to be all encompassing, but it does take place on a planetary scale. It thinks about humans within geological time without reducing them to a single entity. Three, the transition from postmodernism to the Anthropocene. In addition to its critique of grand narrative, the term postmodern was initially associated with the critique of art that made 
uh, that was supposed to be, uh, excuse me, let me let me try that sentence again. In addition to its critique of grand narrative, the term postmodern was initially associated with the critique of art that was supposed to express an author's individual interior life. In the place of self-expression, creative techniques like appropriation, copying, collage, collaboration, juxtaposition, or constraints were used to limit the importance of the author's individual psychological life and to make art that was collective, anonymous, and third person. This way of art, uh, making art practiced by collectives like the Situationists, Fluxus, and others, was thought to undermine bourgeois individualism and competition as, quote, a way of life, as Raoul Van Eigen put it in Revolution in Everyday Life. Today, in many contemporary artworks about climate change, we see these techniques being used, but stretched towards something new, towards a new kind of encounter with nature or the elements. Consider the glacial watercolor paintings of Olafur Eliasson, works that are produced by melting glacial ice from the Northern Atlantic Ocean onto watercolor paper. Here you see an example from this series, a 2016 piece called The Overlapping Memory of Two Small But Very Old Pieces of Glacial Ice. Like Duchamp's Fountain, these works as appropriations of ice do not express the interior life of the artist. Still, these works extend creative practices like appropriation in a new way towards some encounter with nature or the elements. Consider a different kind of work, Cory Archangel's Super Mario Clouds, where the artist props out the characters in the Nintendo game Super Mario Brothers and leaves only a section of the sky. Here again, it is as though postmodern practices like appropriation are being stretched towards a new relationship with nature or the elements. A more collaborative and uh, thus for me more interesting work is this play about the reinvention of epic in which survival depends on the weather. It's a story about Homer, but it's a story about Homer Simpson. Uh, I discussed this play and Washburn's Mr. Burns at length in the book. Four. The end of nature. Finally, what kind of nature is being encountered here? As Isabel Stingers has put it, we are no longer dealing with a wild and threatening nature or a fragile nature to be protected. The case is new. Whatever this nature is that's being depicted, it is not out there in the pastoral, separate from us. It is intruding on us in our modern cities through storms, floods, fires, and heat such as in this piece, The Flooding of the Louvre by Georgian artist Tezi Gabunia. In addition, when we see nature depicted in art today, it is often an impure or contaminated nature, as in this water photo series by Edward Bertinsky. At other times, nature is wholly synthetic or geoengineered, such as in this 2018 piece by Eduardo Coimbra called Natural Light. A contemporary work of art that I often find myself meditating on is this installation by Sarah Ann Johnson. Johnson's 2012 work is titled Untitled, Schooner and Fireworks. Viewed one way, a colonial era vessel appears to be emitting a large toxic cloud of gases above it. Viewed another way, the large storm cloud is descending on the vessel below as if to devour it. It is as if nature here is a pendulum that was pushed away by human beings, but now swings back at it with a force of its own. This transition from postmodern art to the Anthropocene calls to my mind a strange conclusion of Michel Foucault's Order of Things, where he speaks of humanism as a human face drawn in the sand that will soon be erased by the sea. In sum, a new sense of history is being realized in our art and in our stories today. These artworks often narrate a shared sense of catastrophe. In doing so, they collectivize and politicize our populations before it. This experience of nature, stories about fires or violent weather, for example, is also one of the first things that human beings share. We love to talk about the weather, it's 
It's one of the favorite things we, uh, uh, we like to discuss. Um, in this sense, these stories about nature are an interesting basis for another kind of community or politics. These shared stories are not going any time away anytime soon either. They will become increasingly violent in the coming years, motivating changes in one way or another. And finally, the last section, that'll be pretty brief and then maybe we can have some discussion. Uh, politics at the end of the world. In my book, I argue that a philosophy for the end of the world requires directing a new sense of collectivity and history towards something more than neoliberal capitalism and something less than ethno-nationalism, borders, war, or a new era of colonialism. I argue for a radical form of democracy on the part of human beings that would have to be won in the coming years, but which is insufficient by itself as a rule of a people. To be clear by democracy, I do not mean liberalism or representation in its current form. I mean a more radical or extreme form of democracy that was initially described as, quote, oligarchy's enemy and one that comes into being when the poor win. This is its initial description. It was also said to, quote, throw open its city to the world and never by alien acts exclude others, as Thucydides put it. Still, in the end, I argue that a rule of a people or demos is insufficient by itself for an Anthropocene. This democracy would have to be one and conceived of and one, um, but transitioned into something more than a rule of a people or demos, into something like a zoocracy, a rule or kratos of zoe or life itself, a government that sustains life and which allows us to live in a way where life flourishes rather than the way we are forced to live now biopolitically. We have all the climate solutions we need in the latest IPCC mitigation report. It tells us exactly what we have to do, uh, which sources of alternative energy uh, will make the biggest impact, uh, which, uh, which practices to focus on and target. Uh, we know precisely what to do. We've developed the names, practices, and institutions for a post-human form of politics even. Um, the tour called it a democracy extended to things in 1993, way back then. Uh, a post-human delegation, a geocracy, earth democracy, a government of the living. But this theoretical work is still incomplete, right? If we only identify norms or values for a world that has never existed and will never exist, a world that, a world that we'll never live in. So what I wanna do instead then is briefly describe how the conditions are ripe for something like uh, a zoocracy or a democracy that could be won and, and transformed into a zoocracy. That is how it could be assembled, how it could be mobilized, in short, how we can win. Let me explain. Here, to be spe specific enough, I need to localize some of my analysis to the US, um, though I think there'll be some, some interesting resonances in India and other parts of the world. Um, so let me, let me conclude. Looking back, one of the great peculiarities of the last half century was how a relatively obscure and reactionary theory called neoliberalism, a contemporary mutation of capitalism, came to shape the curriculum of elite universities, become touted by some of the world's leading economic ministers and hollow out much of the public nature of the state. Rather than leaving private enterprises alone, like the laissez-faire capitalism of the 18th or 19th centuries, neoliberal governments were supposed to use the resources of the state to closely assist, monitor, and intervene in the financial market for the, for the market's state, sake. So state-supported capitalism, instead of leaving the markets alone, um, supporting uh, the markets with state resources. That's uh, neoliberalism. It's the reason for the neo. In actual practice, this government aid or subsidies went to the fossil fuel industry. This is something that a lot of neoliberal scholarship doesn't focus on. So the, what, where did the largest amount of subsidies or aid go? It went to the fossil fuel industry. How much so? In 2016, government subsidies for fossil fuels, broadly construed, registered around 5 trillion or an astounding 6.4% of the world's GDP. The United States, the second largest subsidizer of fossil fuels, spends 10 times more subsidizing fossil fuels than what it spends on education. Even more astoundingly, with the defense budget the size of the United States, 600 billion in 2015, Fossil fuel subsidies have regularly exceeded Pentagon spending. 
So as Michel Foucault showed, the theory of neoliberal capitalism was not based on a theory of government. It was based on an idea of life that would isolate each of us from anything collective, historical, or political, and redefine our lives as asocial, self-entrepreneurial, and competitive, or economic. For decades then, neoliberal texts prescribed a policy of individuation and competition and opposed all forms of collectivization or socialization. As Barbara Kassan wrote in Google Me, this social policy was amplified and made global through the apparatuses of big tech and social media. The absence of a common world or worldlessness left many of us alone, discouraged, seemingly unable to respond to every major looming challenge. Appearing in public space too, was seen as an assault on neoliberalism and prohibited because it introduced the idea of a collective again. Underneath all this was a false idea of life. Life is private, not public. Economic, not political. This is what Foucault calls neoliberalism's culture of the self, an era of so-called human capital, which he says more than anything attempts to change life itself. And yet, culturally and philosophically, haven't we been telling a different story to one another for some time that changes this idea of life? The Anthropocene shows us that we have never lived as individuals, nor were we ever separate from nature. It proves us to be a collective force and it situates us in a broader web of life. It introduces a shared sense of time after the so-called end of history. This sense of time includes an eschatology that collectivizes, historicizes, and politicizes our populations before the growing threat of climate change, offering what might even be a new climatic approach to solidarity at a time when solidarity has been difficult to find or produce. As cities from Istanbul or LA run out of water, or the smoke blocks the sun for days as it did in New York City here last summer, something beyond a mass of human beings intrudes on our public squares. We know that life has never been more shared. What intensifies this, what intensifies this sense of collectivity further is a shared sense of catastrophe, that we seem to be on the brink of catastrophe altogether. We understand increasingly that a change in outcome depends on collective, not individual action. So not environmental ethics. Um, uh, that would be the last thing that would, uh, or that would be the thing that actually would obscure um, uh, what we need to do. But this transition um, to whatever's next, sort of between where we're at and where we need to go, it, it begs for a specific form of politics to address it. So in conclusion, how would we direct this new sense of collectivity and history being brought about by climate change towards something more than individualism and capitalism, yet something less than borders, war, a new era of colonialism? How would a people organize themselves in a more egalitarian way alongside other forms of life? How might they mobilize? What might compel or hasten their assembly? What might be possible if millions begin to appear alongside the full force of nature, intruding on their public squares? Finally, how might this assembly be transformed into a form of power or rule that would be focused on the flourishing of life itself? I do not want to conclude without mentioning again that we have the climate solutions we need now in the IPCC mitigations report. I also, mentioned, I also want to mention the work of important NGOs like Extinction Rebellion, Fridays for Future, or the Earth Democracy Movement. In addition, I've shared my politics of climate change syllabus online, which introduces eight different approaches for climate politics, eight different political strategies. But what I really want to leave you with is this. Another world is not only possible, it is inevitable. And I think a better world begins with a better idea of life, with knowing how life flourishes despite the way we're forced to live. And it is possible to propose a counter history for human beings in the Anthropocene simply by beginning to practice a different way of life together. 
for this reason, I do not think it is a time to despair or stop living, but a time to assemble as friends with all the living. And all of the elements needed are already here for it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Travis, uh, for your uh, insightful uh, lecture. We learned a lot from you. Uh, now I open this session to questions, uh, uh, observations, if there is any. Uh, Travis will be happy to answer. I think uh, there is one question in the chat box. Travis, could you read it? Shukandu, uh, Sharon box. has a question, I think. Yes, yes. Yes. So I'm um, waiting. Uh, hello. Uh, hello, Prof. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, very interesting and insightful reflections. Um, I just uh, have a question and also it is not exactly a question just for you. It is also sort of self-questioning, which I just wish to wish to share with you. Uh, as you were talking about the artworks and uh, representation of climate crisis, uh, climate catastrophes through artworks and generating a sort of sensitization in that particular context, and I'm speaking from a very localized context in India, I'm not trying to generalize, what we have seen on a lot of occasions, or maybe I will go to the extent of saying on a majority of the occasions, that uh, the artworks are strongly used as a way of generating a counter narrative of resistance against reckless uh, capitalistic exploitations of the natural environment, um, through projects, uh, through uh, public presentations, uh, through marches, public marches. But uh, what I have observed is that they're mostly being initiated by the people, by the individuals who are sitting in a very uh, well sought reputed space, who are sitting in a very elitist space. And in a way, what happens in that process is we are talking about the indigenous communities, let's see an example, but we hardly have representations from the indigenous communities. And uh, it is mostly what happens at the end of the day is we are talking on their behalf, which is in a way a reproduction of that whole colonial narrative of transformation and change where we don't want the subalterns to speak, but we will speak on their behalf. Mm -hmm. So in that context, as you are talking about the end of the world, you have also talked about the end of the white world. So in that context, what could be some of the possibilities to transform this power dynamics and involve the indigenous communities in this process so that through the artworks, so that you know, we don't try to represent them, but rather they talk about their concerns on their own behalf. Maybe if you can reflect on that, Prof. Mm. It's a really interesting question. Um, in, in the, so in the book, I, I talk about this distinction that I think you're making between artworks which pretend as though, look, we can do these things and uh, we'll have a better relationship with nature and this is what it will look like. And many of those works of art are done on, uh, you know, from the elite on behalf of the elite and, it, and many of them make them feel better. Um, they're not, in other words, realistic. Uh, they don't describe what's actually happening, you know, to people right right now, right? Um, uh, rising sea levels, uh, the capital of Indo Indonesia being moved, um, the communities in Marshall Islands, you know, being submerged and worried about nuclear radi radiation. Um, so in the, I, I make this point, um, I also just did an interview called Art at the End of the World, which focuses on this question. Um, I'm interested in telling the stories of those artists, which are, are uh, you know, outside of... Um, uh, that circle of people. But I, I also just want to make this point, and again, this is a local and provincial history. Um, there has there has been a transition um, in the way that people, at least here, um, made art um, 
I don't know, almost like in a Buddhist way, like I can think of Mer Merce Cunningham's nature, like you imagine this dance where it'll be, there'll be nature and, you know, coming into the dance and then he'll come into the, you know, back into the dance with, uh, with, with uh, as a result of nature. There's a reciprocal relationship, in other words, to where, to where today, what is often being depicted is a kind of socialist realism, you know, a kind of, I think, often a decolonial um, uh, realism. You saw the work, for instance, of Precious Okoyama, who's telling the story of Haiti, which is a great example um, of this. And um, that's the kind of art that I think we need to um, put forward. And that's the, that was what the, I think the Venice Biennial did really well. I don't know if that answers your question, but I just want to say I'm also very, very interested in hearing about local accounts, what you think artists are doing there. Um, here, um, it's very interesting that the hurricane, of course, disproportionately affected um, the poorest communities and the ones who had the least resources. And the state did not come to their aid. We didn't have disaster relief. No, no, absolutely, Prof, because as you gave the example, uh, thank you for sharing the example of Venice Finale, because we also have uh, in our country, it's called the Kochi, Kochi Finale in Kerala, in the, in the southern Indian state of Kerala. Yeah. And uh, they also have a same sort of discourse that they follow. For instance, they will uh, take the dilapidated buildings, the broken buildings, and it is inside those buildings where they will create the artwork to invite the people to understand um, the struggles of daily life, environmental violation, right into that space with the natural objects, rather than trying to reproduce that uprooted slash rerouted uh, concept of the colonial uh, ideologies. So, so thank you so much for sharing this. Thanks a lot. Can I just say too, if we oh, have sure, more please. time to please, talk, please. talk about this, um, I'd be I'd be very interested. For instance, my understanding is that in southern India, in Bangalore, for instance, uh, there have been these rain bombs, like high precipitation events. Um, we find a similar example in Pakistan uh, right now, and it just occurs to me that our one of our oldest known stories that we know was a story about a flood. So we we love to tell these stories um, to one another. And it may not rise to the level of like an installation uh, at, you know, the Venice Biennale, but like my working class father, you know, the art that he produced was, uh, he was a produce manager. And so he would put the produce in a certain way and it looked aesthetically, or he would tell stories. And I think that those kinds of stories um, that we're telling about floods or whatever um, to, the, to our neighbors and the way we tell them is just as much about um, art as the whatever installation is in there. So I'd be I'd be really interested in hearing some of those accounts from Kerala and then the South and other uh, places. Thank you mm -hmm. so much for. No, no, absolutely. I will I will actually uh, send you an email uh, to with some of the uh, reflections. And and thank you so much for bringing this concept of storytelling as well because it's such a powerful concept in a way of yeah. uh, transferring the ideas from one place to another. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Travis, I have a question. Uh, I'm very much interested in this Anthropocene project, you know, uh, this. So yeah. uh, do you, uh, you talked a lot about, I mean, uh, neoliberal uh, politics. So my question is, do you think that the present climate catastrophe or uh, sixth mass species extinction uh, actually make us rethink of our existing uh, form of governance. Look, what happens normally, our political system, our governance is thought to be purely intra-human contract, right? Mm -hmm. So so we have the, again, this tendency keeping objectivist polit politics and subjectivist politics away from each other, right? But in the wake of this Anthropocene, the, I mean, this climate change, it has been found that this green element uh, is making its presence more inevitable. So do you think that, that we should rethink our existing democratic governance? Yeah, I think what I'm suggesting, thank you so much for your, your insights, Sukhendu. Um, I think that's exactly what I'm suggesting more, maybe even more specifically, is that whether we rethink our existing governments or not, this is already happening and it will happen in this century. Um, you know, the climate change is intruding. It will intrude even more so. It will disrupt, it will interrupt, you know, 
um, our systems of government. And it's really just a question of how we respond to that. So I think the best thing that we can do is, is to try to think about a way of, um, uh, and I know you have also thought a lot about Latour, is thinking about a government system that would um, organize itself around life itself. Where, um, it's in a recent text by Jean-Luc Nancy, I know you had a, a Nancy event uh, a couple of weeks ago. Nancy speaks about um, creating worlds of all the living together um, in a book uh, called um, Don't Que Monde Vivant Nour, uh, What's These Worlds Coming To? Or What Kinds of Worlds Are We Living In? Would be another title. So I, I think it's not a question of, you know, do we need to? I think it's a question of it's, it's happening. And if we're, if we're honest as scholars, then all those constructs of our, of our philosophies, whether they're, you know, Chakrabarti wants us to talk about Tagore and he's saying it's there, this, it's there, this um, humanism. Mm -hmm. um, I was trained as a scholar in phenomenology. So all these discussions of a world versus earth, like um, Heidegger will talk about a world and how, you know, um, uh, if, you're, if you're a plant or an animal, you're poor in world or you, you have no world. Um, Arendt will pick that up and develop a really a political philosophy of a human constructed world. And it's not to say that, that these philosophers don't have an idea of an earth or a nature or whatever, but it's almost that there's this, um, there's this ability that's far too easy there to separate uh, whatever those two things are, a human constructed world, a political sphere, and an earth and we just can no longer make that distinction and um i think i learned that through many people but uh, but mainly through chakrabarti yes. his account of history yes thank you uh travis since you are uh, you talked about uh, Bruno Lato, i must say that uh, there is uh, another uh, famous uh, scholar Latourian scholar who is timothy mitchell timothy mitchell has written an interesting book i i'm sure you have read it carbon democracy in 2000 uh, 11, where he denounces this, I mean, denatured politics, right? Okay, so what happens is that any elected government comes for a very short uh, period of time, let's say for five years. And within that, as you are saying, within that short period of time, it is very difficult for a government to fulfill all its promises. And what yeah. happens, it, it, it starts, uh, I mean, uh, exploiting resources and everything. And that leads to this kind of catastrophe. So uh, yes, uh, Timothy Mitchell's book is a kind of, I mean, good contribution to this uh, political debate. So what kind of governance uh, should be in the wake of this unprecedented uh, climate catastrophe? Yeah, I'm Thank just you. looking at books on my shelf uh, because I, uh, in addition to that book, I'm thinking about the um, the opening of Latour's book Down to Earth, um, Down to where Earth. he yeah or Uta Atarir, like where to land, like where where should we you know um, land, and um, he says uh, uh, he says and, may, and this is a, too much of a universal history, and I think Chakravarti criticizes him for that, but he says beginning in the 1980s, our governments began to shelter themselves. And to think that um, government, you know, its job was not to respond to these crises, uh, these coming crises, but instead to try to build enclaves or, or private worlds that could um, withstand them. So we're seeing like a one attempt to try to escape the planetary destruction that we're all, you know, which will not, will obviously decide not work. Um, you know, giving um, tax cuts to in my country, at least to um, Jeff Bezos, so he can build a colony on Mars or you know, Elon Musk, et cetera. Yeah, yes. These things, no one, there's no other planet. Uh, it, will never, it will never work. So, um, nor does anyone want to live in a bunker or for how long is a good question, right? Um, and and who, who has that? Why would we even think about that as a possibility when uh, the rest of the world, right? The, uh, one, one person gets to do that and, and uh, the other 8 billion do not. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm interested in this, uh, in this, and and what kind of strategies we maintain. But I do want to, and maybe I could just put this in the chat. Um, there are all different kinds of political strategies for a climate politics. Um, mm -hmm. We see in Germany youth using the language of life um, to take older generations to court and to to say that they have prevented their ability to live. 
and winning, you know, um, further decarbonization efforts by 2030. Um, that's under like a liberalism model, like it's under a, you know, climate justice model. But then there are eco-socialist eco perspectives. Um, I think what's so hard uh, that Indian scholars will often tell you about the Indian context um, is, and, and Chakrabarti has pointed this out, you know, to me, is that when we're talking about a balance between lifting livelihoods and coal is such a cheap, you know, energy resource for a developing country, it's very difficult um, for all those forces to come together. And you may know of the example of Sampeta, um, the struggle against the coal fire power, power plant uh, in, in India, and how you know, people won that struggle. Um, but then there's this other conversation about, um, yeah, how do, you do, how do you lift livelihoods and how do you do it in a way that's, um, that's cheap? And so it has to depend, this is where the COP meeting um, was, the UN speech was, was um, uh, you know, insufficient, but the language was uh, wealthier countries that have the capital that have been already industrialized have to, you know, give link, give uh, uh, funds for um, development, for adaptation, and for mitigation um, to uh, other countries that are developing. Uh, and I think that's a, a key um, switch. But so it, it, COP obviously is a is a sham, and I think many of us know that. So. Um, looking at different political strategies, what will work, and then more importantly, I think looking at what the conditions are for, for uh, motivating those um, uh, movements. And I, I really mean it, I, I, you know, I, as someone who struggled for a lot of socialist struggles for a long time, and really felt as though ah, it's so hard, we, we live in a police ordered state, it, you know, this is, this is the experience of those protesters in Sompeta. We live in a police state, Whenever we go out in a public square, we're hit uh, or beaten down, you know, by by the police order for for trying to um, exercise uh, some kind of uh, uh, public assembly or public speech in dissent. So many in my general, I mean, we're always looking for new things, but what we have with climate change, not to romanticize it, there's nothing romantic about it, right? What we have is something that assembles even in excess of human beings assembling. When that flood, you know, hits southern India, or when all of a sudden, you know, Pakistan is underwater, like the whole country, what is it that we, you know, there's something more going on there, and it's forcing. I think it's forcing a change, whether whether we, you know, say it is or not, it's happening, um, and I think we just have to try to direct that towards something better than uh, rather than something that's, um, you know, less equal. I don't know that that answered your question, um, but I think it's. Uh, I know I know you've done a lot of work on this. Yes, thank you, Travis. Uh, you pointed out many other things uh, which I did never put this way. Thank you for making this point. Now I would request. Uh, Shukandu, uh, I have a question. Can I pose it that here? Yeah. Uh, Travis, uh, thank you for your wonderful lecture. Like I was just wondering one thing, which is this: that you know, like uh, we understand that the climate of history and the history of the climate. And that, that, that is basically inseparable. And, you know, like uh, we are speaking of it in terms of a, a state of contingency, which uh, is basically universal and understandable. But, uh, you know, like uh, the quintessence of uh, extractive ideologies that have, you know, like proliferated all over the world and what, you know, Amitav Ghosh uh, mentions as the great acceleration in the last two decades and all that. Uh, and is it really uh, kind of, you know, a, a, a holistic counter to the general narrative that we are trying to posit? Because uh, neoliberal, you know, challenges have been faced even in pockets where, you know, alternative visions have cropped up. I'll give you an example. Like, for instance, uh, Tagore's uh, Shanti Niketan uh, was an essence of a kind of, you know, a topos that tried to work things in a different manner in terms of preservation and all that. But we find a very different Shantini Ketan now, where you know the neoliberal impulses are completely changing the dynamics of that all. So, uh, and and when you're talking about floods and other things, like it's viewed as contingent, it's viewed as a one-time affair. Things are forgotten after that. So, how would you kind of you know react to this uh, this this acceleration of you know uh, the the so-called holistic idea of progress, which is not holistic at all? Uh, in in pragmatic terms, how would that be a possibility? And, yeah. and how would, of course, that have an artistic representation as well? If you could answer that. Yeah, I'm thinking uh, that 
you know, we could think here of Naomi Klein's disaster capitalism, um, where these disasters further um, neoliberal capitalist methods of extraction, and, and et cetera, um, they, they present themselves as opportunities, you know, for more capitalism, more extraction. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. And um, there is no sense in which this can, um, you know, I'm, I'm saying, I, I, I don't want, to, I hope it doesn't come across in any way that I'm saying that this is the direction that it will go. I'm saying that it's undecided. Um, and what I'm, what I'm, um, what I'm wondering as a theorist is whether it's possible to track certain conditions uh, to, to go in a different direction. Um, I also take the point about um, Tagore, and in some ways it's similar to what, um, uh, in some different ways, it's, it's similar to what uh, Heidegger and Arendt were trying to do with this relationship between the world, world and earth. Um, but um, that's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting point about um, furthering uh, extraction. Like we could easily imagine that, right? We could easily imagine that there would be almost a new era of neo-colonialism, uh, even worse than what we have now, as a result of, for instance, um, the Western, you know, uh, 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 Middle East, um, the Eastern side of the Mediterranean running out of water. Um, where do they get it? You know, um, uh, Western United States, uh, similarly running out of water, the Colorado River Basin, um, where do they get it? Uh, it so happens that the Nestle company is buying up land all around our Great Lakes region in the north, which is um, which abuts uh, Canada. So, um, but beyond that, obviously, it's a global uh, system of extraction, and um, uh, we can we we're in a global food supply chain. We're in a global, you know, everything else. So I, I completely agree, um, and that's why I think it's important to emphasize that climate change won't affect us all in the same way. Um, and I am sitting here in a country that will have privilege in that regard, uh, although one can say that uh, I'm not sure because it's a very individualist country where people are, are um, you know, um, not necessarily focused on collective or collective aid. Um, and there's a sense here, at least, that um, when these disasters or crises happen, um, that the government will not come to our assistance. Uh, any... Um, I'm not sure that that answered all your questions, but I think it's a good question. I'm also just interested in general, what the perspective of is in India. There was a really interesting question that was put on the call for papers, um, which was, were we already post-human? Um, and I think that's a, those kinds of questions are, are really important and interesting. Um, yes, uh, Travis, we have one more question in the chat box. Uh, so, Modichanda writes, uh, how do you view the role of technology in the new uh, kind of democracy that you talked about? This is one. And another, uh, I mean, question with it, as, you, as we know, technology, especially digital technology, is controlled by capitalist system. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a big... Uh, questions that um, I don't work specifically on in terms of, um, yeah, in terms of technology. Uh, and I think it's, um, uh, I think it's true that um, this era of, of big tech, um, of uh, monopoly tech, uh, basically, I mean, you probably all know this history, but one of the transitions into neoliberalism is that um, up until you know 1975, you have this idea that there will monopolies if they if they exist, they'll be broken up. So they'll be broken up into smaller, discrete companies. But after the 1980s, there's this idea that you allow a company to become a monopoly so that it compete on a global scale. It's sort of an intro to globalization. So you can have Dell, for instance, making computers in India, um, exploiting workers there and polluting. You know, this is the key example of uh, polluting. Um, local ecosystems uh, with chemicals. Um, I, I think it's important to resituate, I mean, this around questions um, like the one that um, Dr. Uh, Sudadi Paul just mentioned about extraction. Um, when I think about my phone, I think about um, <laughs> those minerals being extracted from Africa assembled in Southeast Asia. Um, and, uh, you know, at 
obviously very in, in I mean, what essentially slave uh, labor conditions and then um, being sent back to the US and wrote for um, global and monopoly corporations. So I think there will have to be a lot of shifts um, in the way that we um, go in terms of technology. We've recently had a bill in the United States that is supposed to help advance um, uh, alternative uh, energy techs. Uh, and um, it's, uh, it's not on a scale that's needed to be. And uh, we, we will just, we will see uh, whether many of those subsidies end up going to, um, you know, the kinds of companies who want to want to actually do something, who have actually been doing something, or whether they go to um, companies that kind of serve as a buffer um, between, um, you know, what really needs to be done. I don't know if that answers your question. I'm, I'm not um, as focused on technology, but um, I think it's an interesting one, especially if we resituate it in terms of extraction. <laughs> Uh, may I add one thing to this to your observation? Uh, I think what Modi Chandra was trying to say, uh, this answer has been given by Bruno Latour, uh, love your monsters, right? And Latour argues that uh, the scene of, of, of the creator was not that uh, he created the monster, right? But the problem is that he failed to take care of that monster. So climate change produced by this human activity uh, is, a, is that kind of monster and we are fleeing away from it. So we should not escape, rather we should take care of it. So this was uh, Bruno Latour's take on this. Uh, uh, he reread, uh, actually he, re he rewrites this uh, Frankenstein I mean, myth. And he says that this is going to be the new parable of our time yeah and that technics and time yeah series mm -hmm. I, I i yes uh-huh um very good uh anything else i mean i could ask all of you yes um i see in the chat thank you dr das um and uh we really should say that uh, that there's a lot of organizational work um, that you're doing um i think making an intervention in contemporary theory I think it's also just, if I could say, important that you are finding and elevating scholars um, in, at least in, in the US, but in other places where they might not have the influence um, that um, uh, they, they would necessarily uh, in their fields as a result of certain things. Um, and um, their, their arguments have more influence as a result of you um, uh, supporting them and encouraging them. Um, so I think it's, uh, I think it's significant. Yes. So I would uh, request a uh, uh, co-convener of this uh, conference, Dr. Subodhi Paul, uh, to end this session with vote of thanks. Dr. Paul. Yes, uh, Shukendu, uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, yes. Uh, we thank uh, Travis Holloway for uh, his illuminating you know, presentation. Uh, and uh, I'm sure this book would create uh, a lot of reverberations in different parts of the world, at least in the academic circuit. This is the second book launch we are having, and this is a virtual launch. And we would love to have you in person someday in our university, especially in the Center for Research in the Post-Humanities that Shukendu and I we are collectively trying to uh, upgrade and run in future. So thank you so much for the time that you have given. And uh, I wish you all, we wish you all uh, the best for your book. And I'm sure that alternative vision and or visions that you talk about would uh, you know, definitely uh, hold us accountable and uh, make sense in ways more than one in times to come. So thank you once again from the entire team of Bakur University the administration and the academic block. We thank you for your uh, virtual presence. Namaskar. Thank you. Have a nice day, Travis. Uh, looking forward. Thank you all very much. You again. Yes. I'm honored. Thank you very much. Bye bye.